So hi there, welcome to this uh, webinar on uh, exploring 19th century home office records. My name's uh, Chris Day, I'm a modern domestic record specialist here at the National Archives and uh, I hope you enjoy the webinar. So um, let's get started shall we? So just got some objectives for today's webinar. Uh, which, I mean, sounds a little bit prescriptive, but hopefully just things that we'll come to a shared understanding about in the course of it. So the sort of three main things are, is hopefully, um, by the end of the webinar, we can all understand sort of the Home Office's role and, and roles in the 19th century, its growing roles. Um, we'll gain an understanding of what home office, record, home office records are held here at the National Archives, and gain an understanding of how we go about searching for these records and using them once we've ordered them up. Um, I'd like to draw your attention at the start, actually, before we get anything to the, this guide here, Home Office Correspondence 1782 to 1979, one of the research guides on the National Archives website. Um, really, is your very best friend when you're searching for Home Office records, and uh, it is far more comprehensive than I could hope to be in 45 minutes. Uh, but, you know, do watch this as well as reading it, please. Um, okay, so uh, let us begin. Um, and I'd like to sort of think about um, sort of what form Home Office records take, well, and, and why we have the records from the Home Office. Um, so Home Office formed in 1782, and what sort of role does it have in the 19th century? Uh, well, it's formed at the same time as the Foreign Office, and it's basically sort of in charge of sort of domestic affairs in Britain. And initially that starts with sort of main duties like keeping the peace exercising the prerogative of mercy, dealing with criminal matters to a certain extent, and sort of being the sort of link between the domestic population of Britain in many ways and the sort of government at large, and which is still sort of embodied in that way by sort of the royal power in, in 1782 to a certain extent. Uh, you can find out more about the duties of the Home Office uh, in books like this. Uh, this is in the National Archives Library. It's the uh, powers and duties of the Principal of State, Secretary of State for the Home Department, which is still the, uh, the official name of the Home Secretary. Uh, why do we have the records? Well, like other central government departments, the Home Office is bound by the Public Records Act um, going on from 1838 onwards to transfer records to us at the, what was the Public Record Office, and which is now the National Archives, uh, and they do so throughout the 19th century onwards. Um, actually, this is a, um, a letter from 1899 the Public Record Office sent to the Home Office, sort of asking them to send their records over a sort of more manageable chunks. They had a habit of uh, realising that their storage space was full and just sending what they could sort of knew they could clear out immediately and the Home Office was like, please can you just sort of send us larger bits, which they did eventually all this sort of stuff. Um, but what form do Home Office records in the 19th century take, you, you might ask? Well, today we're going to be talking about two sort of main kinds of categories of records as far as we're going to be concerned here. And it's important to learn sort of the the uh, sort of language of vocabulary for these. So I'm just going to look at those now. So basically what we're talking about when we're talking about home office records is we're talking about the incoming letters they receive, and these will be letters, although we might look at some telegrams later as well, um, and the, the outgoing mail to a certain extent. That's how the home office is sort of completing its business. Um, and just like on our email clients nowadays, we have an, a, you know we have our sent items and we, our inbox. Again, in the 19th century, these things are divided up between outgoing and incoming, and we use sort of particular words for them. So um, when we're talking about letters sent in from a lovely oak writing desk here to the Home Office, which is not in Parliament but is quite near it, uh, we refer to these records as correspondence. That's the incoming mail. Um, but we don't refer to the outgoing stuff as correspondence. To, we do a little bit, but it's sort of what we really were talking about is things like entry books or letter books, um, which might be a confusing term, but effectively they mean they're usually um, bound volumes in which uh, home office clerks will, will enter either longhand copies or uh, praises of letters that are being sent out to people. And they give us a record of what the home office is saying. So we get both sides of the story. You can see, once again, the, the mail from the home office is coming from wherever the Home Office is behind Parliament, um, to that wonderful writing desk again. Um, and what sort of things are the Home Office dealing with? Well, I'm just going to have a sort of brief sort of think about how the, you know, as I've said, the Home Office's role expands as the state does. Um, so, just have a sort of 
quick think about what sort of responsibilities the Home Office takes on 19th century, what sort of things you might find within its papers. Um, so, as I'm sure we all know, the <clears throat> British state expands um, <clears throat> exponentially throughout the 19th century. It takes on more and more responsibilities, and the Home Office um, takes on many of these responsibilities, some of which have now been sort of taken in under other government departments, but they often initially get given to the Home Secretary to deal with. Uh, some of the things that the Home Office takes on are things like uh, children, uh, fire services, burial grounds, massive problem in the late middle 19th century with overflowing burial grounds, not enough being commissioned, so the Home Office takes control of those. The police, um, uh, obviously we often refer to a policeman as Bobbies, after the um, 19th century Home Secretary Robert Peel, Bobby Peel. Uh, riot and disorder there, I think there's some charters kicking off. Civil defence, uh, represented there by uh, Warden Hodges. Dad's Army, probably the most famous civil defence officer in British uh, sort of folklore. The civil defence is something which has been going on for a long time. Um, mines, um, there, bloke in a mine. Uh, drugs and poisons, ably represented by some clip art there. Uh, prisons, not going to really deal with crime that much today, but it's a big part of the Home Office dealings. Um, that's HMP Brixton, I believe. Factories, um, Home Office is responsible for sort of regulating safety in factories, particularly after the passage of the sort of 1830s Factory Acts and their subsequent uh, sort of amendments and revisions. Immigration and naturalization um, and explosives. Um, fireworks are the nicest kind of explosives, that's what I thought we'd use a picture of those for. Um, so that's sort of the role that expands across the 19th century. Uh, we're going to dip into a couple of things here. I'm sort of sticking towards the right and disorder because that's, that's what interests me. I think it's quite interesting. A little bit of crime and a, a little bit of drunkenness. Um, but now I'm going to sort of get on to, to the meat and we're going to look at sort of where we find these records and where the principal series of records for, from the Home Office in the 19th century are. Okay, so um, it's going to sound odd, but I would like us all to think about the Home Office, Home Office correspondence in the 19th century, leaving out the entry books and the outgoing stuff for now. As having sort of two principal ages, um, and the first age, which runs up until about 1848, um, is the sort of age of unregistered series of correspondence, uh, which is represented by the, these series here. Um, effectively, series like HO42 and HO52 are sort of unbound sort of stacks of letters, bundles of letters. Uh, which are just kept in chronological order, and they deal with all sorts of things. Um, they're very similar to, if anybody's familiar with the state papers, um, they sort of are the sort of successor of that, because as the Secretary of State, who uh, papers are collected in the state papers collection, um, two of the two principal Secretaries of State become the Secretary of State for the Home and Foreign Department. Um, that's where we get these sort of unsorted letters. Um, and... Uh, yeah, they really give us sort of a, a, a kaleidoscope of sort of British life in the period. So we have HO42, which is um, referred to as domestic correspondence George III, which runs from 1782 to 1820, when George III um, went away of all flesh. And then HO52 here, um, counties correspondence, which is arranged by county and, and later by place, running from 1820 to 1850. That's a bit of a misnomer, actually. The early pieces of HO52 are not arranged by county. They're not really arranged at all. We also have this odd series here, HO44, um, which as far as I can work out, is probably some papers that got left in the Home Office and then eventually sent over to the PRO, Public Record Office, as was. Um, and uh, it's a separate series, full of lots of interesting stuff, actually. That's been catalogued. Um, yeah, quick note of cataloging. HO42 has been catalogued in part. Uh, we're still working on some more cataloging for it in a detailed way, but usually it's only searchable by, uh, by date range. Um, HO52 is very similar. Some pieces have been catalogued. Most of it is only searchable by date range and by county. I would suggest consulting the guide that I gave you a link to at the start, and uh, which um, I believe will be sent out with the webinar to everyone to find out more about which bits are catalogued. Now on to the second age, which is revealing itself there, ringed in red. Um, in 1848, the Home Office is dealing with an increasing amount of correspondence. Um, and so what they decide to do, in line with a lot of other central government departments, whose records are here in the National Archives, is they decide to um, start registering their correspondence. 
um, centrally so they can track it themselves. And that helps us track it now. Um, and this is where we find the bulk of the Home Office papers after 1848. They actually go back and re-register correspondence from 1839 onwards, but um, 1848 is when the system is brought in. And effectively, they register all their papers in a series called HO46, which is the daily registers. They run to the, to the 1950s, but we're going to deal with the 19th century today. Um, and effectively, uh, I mean, like many of you and us at the National Archives here, here we have email correspondence. We give everything a number so we can track it, and that's basically what these do in paper form. They give pieces of correspondence a number so that it can be followed up. And the papers that are registered by that series are in two series here at the National Archives, HO45 and HO144. Um, both described as registered papers. HO144 is registered papers supplementary. Deals with more sensitive matters. It was actually sort of created artificially um, when Home Office was transferring some material in the early 20th century, uh, which they wanted to close for 100 years because of its sensitive nature, as opposed to uh, 50 years for most papers at those time, at that time. Now we obviously have the 30-year movie to the 20-year rule. Uh, but that's why that system exists. Uh, so effectively, they are the same records, just in two different series. Um, now, we're going to look at these later, but I want us first to start with these unregistered papers, particularly HJ42, we're going to take a look at. Um, now, why are they reg not registered is because they don't have that much to deal with. As I said, the, the responsibilities expand out across the sort of years. Uh, but in the early days of the Home Office, I was recorded by uh, Jill Pellew in a very good history of the Home Office from 1848 to 1914. Um, uh, she says, you know, in the early days of the Home Office, the incoming correspondence was still, still small enough in volume for the Home Secretary to scrutinise the Daily Mail, and we don't mean the paper. Um, do you mean sort of the letter back coming in? Effectively, in the early days of the Home Office, particularly we're going to be looking at 1819, 1817 in a minute, um, the only people making decisions on sort of business to do with domestic politics through the Home Office are, is the Home Secretary themselves, and uh, their two under secretaries, their permanent under secretaries, sort of what we now think of as the senior civil servant and the parliamentary undersecretary. And they are the only people who make decisions on matters. They have a team of clerks who write letters for them, help with the president, put up old files for them, write letters, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's only the three of them making decisions. So they are looking at every bit of mail. Um, and you can, you know, you often see that reflected in, sometimes the undersecretary really only want to look at it and he has slightly different opinions, but. Um, so yeah, that's why we have the unsorted series, really, because they would have seen everything, so they don't need to sort of have it registered. Um, so, incoming correspondence in the sort of this first age. We've already discussed HO42 and HO52 and HO44. Disturbances correspondence here relates to riots, runs from 1812 to 1855, which is a bit of a weird date. Um, it's a little bit different and sort of anomalous from the rest of these. Um, and we will discuss it in a minute, I assure you, because it is an absolutely fascinating um, collection. But I just wanted to take a sort of look at HO42 for a second and think about how sort of, because this correspondence is more or less is complete. There's, there's, there's not been uh, what we call weeding. There's not been stuff which has been pulled out and destroyed because it's not of historical importance. It's, it's comprehensive. Um, and as a result, we get a really interesting view of sort of, uh, you know, domestic affairs in Britain in the period we're looking at there. And so sort of we find uh, stuff which is sort of quite infamous in our sort of historical collective memory, uh, sort of sitting cheek by jowl with very mundane, well, mundane, but very interesting matters at the same time. So I just thought I'd take an example of that. Um, so we're going to look at one particular piece of HO42, HO42192. Um, and that is, uh, it covers the date range, uh, the 14th of August, 1819, to the 22nd of August, 1819. Now, those of you who have been interested in uh, the history of 19th century radicalism um, may be aware that 1819 is the year of the, the infamous Peterloo Massacre. Uh, and if you don't know what the Peterloo Massacre is, I will give you a very, very quick rundown of what it is. Uh, the Peterloo Massacre is basically the name which referred to um, a sort of disastrous demonstration by around 60,000 people in Manchester in, in 1819, the 16th of August 1819. Um, around 6,000 people had assembled on St. Peter's Field in Manchester um, to demonstrate for parliamentary reform. Um, it was from the start sort of billed as a peaceful demonstration, but the Home Office and the magistrates in Manchester, who they were very close contact with at that time, 
magistrates would run agents to try and inform on people and, you know sort of generally sort of be the home secretary's eyes and ears and sort of his it's also his, his fist to a certain extent in the provinces in that period um so the magistrates and the home office are very concerned um so as a result they keep a very close eye on it they also deploy a cavalry and yeomanry or sort of volunteer cavalry on the day to make sure there's no trouble at the demonstration the demonstration is peaceful in conduct um but sort of in a confusion cavalry charged the crowd um and 600 people were injured and 15 killed including a child and it's referred to the peterloo massacre as a play on words as the the waterloo massacre and HF 42192 provides us with some of the sort of most detailed historical accounts of Peterloo as it was happening. Um, so, for instance, here on folio 207 of HF 42 192, we have the first written report that the Home Office receives um, of the Peterloo massacre. Um, it's a letter from um, a man called uh, H. Allen, who's a magistrate from Huddersfield, who happened to be in Manchester at the time. You can see the close relationship the Home Office has with magistrates at this point, where he refers to the Home Secretary and his Under Secretaries as gents. Um, he basically reports what's happened. There's been some, some, some the cavalry charged the crowd, and they are currently sort of trying to clear the streets and in all directions. Um, it's sent overnight on a coach, so the Home Secretary doesn't actually receive it until the 17th of August. Um, but you can see it's very hastily scribbled on some scrap paper there. So that's sort of the news is traveling as fast as it possibly can. Um, so we get these really, really exciting letters, but also the Home Office isn't just dealing with sort of the exciting stuff here. Um, because a few days beforehand, um, on further 94 of this piece, they receive a letter meant from a man called Charles Butler, um, who, as far as I can work out, was a lawyer. Um, and Butler's letter is. Um, it's very similar to one of the hundreds of emails and letters that uh, we at the National Archives receive every year from members of the public, because it's asking for um, for archival research advice. Uh, basically, Butler is um, after copies of petitions and examinations of, of, of Catholics, of Roman Catholics, um, taken during the Elizabethan period, which he thinks might be in the state paper office, um, which contained the state papers, uh, which some of which are now held in the National Archives. It was abolished in the 19th century um, after the establishment of the Public Record Office. Um, and so he asked for this advice. Actually, strangely, if you look on the reverse, which I haven't got a picture of, uh, you will see that the Home Office commissions a search of the state paper office for him to see if the records are there, um, which we don't really have the resource to do nowadays. But I'm sure if they had research guides, they probably would have sent him a copy of one of those as well. Um, I think this just goes to show the sort of range of sort of from sort of the the infamous and the sort of very quite scary and violent. To sort of the more sort of uh, workaday stuff that the Home Office deals with, and just how much of a range you can get in these pieces of correspondence. Um, now, I mentioned entry books before the outgoing correspondence because if you look through HO42, which which you can, it's um, it's on digital microfilm, uh, available to download for free from the National Archives website. As is HO52 and HO40, which we'll deal with in a minute. Um, you'll notice that there aren't any replies in there. Sometimes there are scribbled replies on the backs of letters, um, but not full replies. Where do we find those? Well, as I said before, we find them in the entry books, which will reveal themselves now. And you see, the Home Office sort of, as opposed to having these unsorted series to a certain extent, they start creating sort of particular discrete series of records to deal with uh, re copies of replies for particular kinds of business. So. And it's always worth thinking about where a reply to a certain letter might end up. So the first letter from, from Mr. Allen, the magistrate, it quite deals with quite a sensitive matter. So we would expect that to end up in a record series like HO79, private and secret entry books, um, which sort of deal with the sensitive matters. They're, they're quite good. Um, whereas Mr. Butler's letter is, is, is relatively sort of normal, and, and I would call it quite common and garden or domestic, if you will. So we'd expect that to end up in HO 43, the domestic letter books, or entry books. It's all, the, the words are interchangeable. Um, entry books are a really interesting way to sort of read yourself into what the Home Office is dealing with a particular subject in that period, uh, because they deal with specific subjects, particularly during this period when you have this unsorted correspondence, which often isn't catalogued that well. Um, 
they aren't catalogued well themselves. Uh, a couple of HS79 pieces have been catalogued to letter level, um, but mostly it's a case of um, searching for a year range with the series in advanced search and ordering up the particular volume, having a flick through to see what they're up to. Um, so yes, and also you can see here that a lot of these entry books run far longer than the pieces of uh, series of correspondence. HA42 end in 1820, HA43 did the nested letter book, runs on 1898, which shows that these entry books carry on after sort of that 1848 cut-off point for registering correspondence I spoke about. And uh, we'll, we'll see how they continue to be relevant in the sort of second age of uh, correspondence soon. But I want to return to uh, HO40, uh, this rather interesting series of domestic disturbances correspondence, which I said was a little bit unusual because whereas it sort of sits sort of a man alone, not being sort of an unsorted series of correspondence. Um, and basically it allows the Home Office to collect together correspondence to do with sort of riot and fear of radicalism throughout the country, running from um, sort of early in the 19th century with the Luddite disturbances in the, in, in the first decade, um, through to uh, sort of the parliamentary reform that we see in the, the uh, sort of 1810s after, the, after 1815 and the Napoleonic War finishes, and then through to uh, things like charters in the middle of the 19th century. And it really is a fantastic collection of stuff for anybody who's interested in the history of radicalism or the history of working people in this country. Uh, and I recommend you look at it. It's also on digital microfilm. The cataloging is variable in detail. It's, it's better than some other Home Office series, but it's worth looking through, I do, do assure you. Um, now, part of the stuff collected in HO40 is actually um, from sort of running from 1816 to 1817. And it was collected together under the auspices of uh, the Home Secretary, Lord Sidmel, who was also Home Secretary during the Peterloo Massacre in 1819, um, to be collected together to be presented to um, a series of correspondence about radicalism in the UK, presented to the House of Lords to a commission of secrecy uh, to sort of justify um, Lord Sidmel's actions to, taken against radicalism, including um, in 1817 suspending habeas corpus, which um, is the, the right to trial by jury, which allowed him to imprison radicals without charge, uh, which he did. Uh, not a popular man. Um, and so I'm just going to have a look at the sort of things you can find in HO40 quickly by having a look at this, the Pentrich Rising of 1817. I'm probably mispronouncing the name of Pentrich. Uh, it used to be spelled Pentridge, so I'm going to go with that. Um, now, the Pentridge Rising takes um, place in 1817 and uh, this is a tumultuous time um, for the working people of England. They're not, they're not having a great time, particularly the years after, immediately after the Napoleonic Wars finished in 1815 are, are quite bad for working people in, in Britain. Um, there's a number of different reasons. I mean, so there's an economic depression after the war, as there so is often, often is after the war. Um, the Corn Wars, which are sort of designed to try and protect uh, agricultural prices put the prices of, of bread and other stuff up, which is particularly bad for working class people, although they wouldn't be referred to as working class because they haven't really been proletarianised. Um, things like the repeal of the Apprenticeship Act sort of lead to sort of less secure employment for people. So we see things like the beginnings of the parliamentary reform movement because a lot of people see that sort of uh, the way to sort of find restitution for this is to sort of be able to vote for their own MPs and actually have some say in how the country is run as opposed to at the moment where you have sort of an oligarchy of landowners sort of running the country. Um, and this creates a, a reaction from government as well, including the suspension of habeas corpus in 1817 in March. And there's sort of, you know, rebelling, rebellion, it's quite serious rebellion is fermenting. And then we have the Pentridge Rising on the 9th of June of 1817, which is in some ways sort of England's last proper revolution, although, as we will see, not a particularly successful one. Um, there's a copy here of a pamphlet which is actually seized from a prisoner, which we find in HF40. There's a whole series of uh, documents which were presented to the House of Lords which were found on radicals who were arrested. This is a pamphlet called Address to the People. Uh, and it really sums up the sort of the situation, the feeling among certain groups in society, the disaffected, as they were called by uh, the authorities at the time, quite well. Uh, the writer remarks on sort of the, the state of, of people's kitchens at the time. He says, we find our cupboards void our ceilings, which once bowed with well-fed beef, are now adorned with dried, her dried herbs and with the ragged remnants of famished spiders. 
The poor journeyman manufacturers are obliged to work late and early, to get money to pay enormous prices for food, to cruel adulterators of our bread, who at this melancholy moment are poisoning us with their villainy under the pretense of enabling farmers to pay their enormous rents and of course keep up the splendor of the landholder. So you can see, you know, this is like full on class war to a certain extent, although obviously we don't really talk about class here because people have to be proletarian eyes. Um, but the, basically this pamphlet goes on to sort of appeal directly to the Prince Regent saying that basically the solution to this problem is to give working men the franchise so they can vote for their own government and they can have a fair government. Um, this sort of thing is not received well. You get societies called Hampton Clubs in this period uh, who are effectively debating societies booming for parliamentary reform. They're quite heavily repressed. And against this background, the people start to think about taking more drastic action and calling for people, people who got involved in the, the rising in Pentridge on uh, the 9th of June. 1817. Uh, Pentridge is a village in Derbyshire. You can see it here. There's Derby. Nottingham sort of here-ish. Uh, I had to look that up the other day. My English geography is not as good as it should be. Um, what is the Pentridge Rising? Basically, uh, I'm going to give you a very quick lowdown because I've got a lot to get through. On the 9th of June, about two or three hundred men assembled around the village of Pentridge and its, sort of, uh, its neighbourhood. Um, they are lightly armed. A couple of them have guns, including one of the ringleaders, a man called Jeremiah Brandreth, uh, possibly a relation to Charles Brandreth, so claimed by he, who knows. Um, they basically get together with the idea of, they think they're part of a much larger rising of, of thousands and thousands of men across Derbyshire, Nottinghamshire, and the West Riding of Yorkshire, and the whole northern Midland countries. Uh, that is not the case, and we'll find out why they might think that in a minute. Um, they get together, they start ranging around trying to find food and further support. Um, some people don't want to come up, including uh, one house, they bang on the door, um, a woman refuses to open the door, someone breaks a window and, and, and Jeremiah Brandreth, uh, who's carrying one of the muskets they have, fires through the window and kills a servant inside the house. And that's the sort of one death we have during the rising, in fact. Um, they then try and take an iron foundry, but they're seen off by about three or four men armed, armed with sticks. Uh, it's one of those things where I think they're all very keen on the idea of sort of um, sort of insurrectionary, revolutionary action. But I mean, they are mostly framework knitters, people who sort of work with textiles for a living, and and most people aren't that fond of sort of serious violence, really, when it actually comes down to it. Um, they start marching towards Nottingham, um, where they are stopped on the way the next morning by uh, twenty dragoons. Um, the dragoons are are, are light cavalry. Um, I should say that it's a French one. Um, I think actually originally the etymology is from the uh, um, sort of persecution of the, the Huguenot uh, Protestants in, in France. They're dragooned. Um, about 40 men are captured in the immediate aftermath and the dragoons come in and sort of start arresting them. The others flee. Over the next few months, uh, quite a lot of people are arrested. Um, and HO40 contains a massive amount of detail about what goes on in the Rising. Uh, we can see here, this is the initial report of the Pentridge Rising, uh, sent by the Mayor of Derby to the Home Secretary on the 10th of June, the, the morning after. Um, you know, saying, this is going down. But fortunately, he then received a report, which he sent on again, saying, oh, they've been arrested. Now it's fine, it's over. Um, now, one of the reasons why they were arrested so easily, and why there wasn't quite so much of a panic about this, is because the Home Office were, were effectively quite well forewarned, as were the magistrates of the Rising, although they feared it would be much bigger, as the people involved in the Rising thought it would be. Uh, HF40 um, is full of documents from the run-up to the Rising from Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire, um, particularly from um, spies, and this is how the Home Office knows. The Home Office operate lots of the sort of domestic agents spying on radicals and um, in this period. Um, and they have several who are in the trade of the organisation around the Pentridge Rising, including one particularly famous one, um, William Oliver, or as he comes to know, Oliver the Spy, obviously not the name he was using when he was a spy, that, that would have given the game away. Um, William Oliver um, is a bloke who worked for the Home Office um, from March, March 1817 through to June, just after the Rising. Um, he contacted the Home Office directly, having, having befriended a London radical named Joseph Mitchell and offered his services as a spy. Uh, he then travelled around with, with Mitchell and latterly after Mitchell's uh, arrest in March 1817 with the suspension of habeas corpus, which I've mentioned, um, he travelled around by himself um, 
meeting radicals throughout the Midlands and the North, posing as a London radical and offer to, offering to support a planned insurrection which would come down from the North and take London, take over the government. Um, Oliver is often described as um, one of the first agents provocateur in, in English history, and uh, many people supported his parliamentary reform. He wanted to try and dissociate uh, blame from the Pentridge Rising, claimed that he was actually the instigator, he planned it all. Uh, blame from the Pentridge Rising, claimed that he was actually the instigator, he planned it all. This is probably unlikely, although he definitely seems in his travels to have sort of stoked up feeling amongst people and said, oh, there's actually lots of people who support you. Um, but it seems like the radicals themselves also overestimated their support, as people are often to, said to do. Uh, for instance, one of Oliver's reports, which you can find um, in this file here, HF 49 slash 2, downloadable from the National Archives website. Um, one of the um, delegates from Derby, a sort of conference of radicals trying to plan this rising, claims that there are 30,000 men uh, ready to join with it, instead of sort of the two or three hundred people who take part in Pentridge and run away during the march, um, just because, you know. So it's unfortunate for them, really. Um, lots of stuff in Hadro 4 Here is um, another example of the stuff you get after the rise. And this is a deposition from a man named John Cope, who's arrested after fleeing the, the march, which was around the rising. Uh, Cope basically relies on a sort of classic sort of like, not me, Gov, defence. Um, Basically, he claims to have met um, the Brothers Bacon, who are two of some of the ringleaders of the march, acclaimed ringleaders, in a pub. And they asked him to join a debating society, and he said yes after a couple of pints. <coughs> Pardon me. He signed a petition for the compliance reform. Next thing he says, next thing he knows, it's two in the morning, someone's knocking on his door asking to join a revolution. We've all had it. Um, he sort of claims not to have been involved in the fleet. Um, he gives an interesting account of the rising. Apparently, at some point, someone rides back on a horse to report to the marchers that Nottingham's already been taken because the soldiers are on their side and claims that all taxes are going to be abolished, um, which is a, is a nice idea, I suppose. But um, unfortunately, it's, it's not true, and they are they are soon stopped by a couple of dragoons. Um, but in, in, in seriousness, and this is a serious matter, but I mean, I think this demonstrates sort of the range of stuff you find in HO40, if you're interested in the history of radicalism, you get all sides, and you get many first-person voices of people who are actually there witnessing these events. And these are, this is a raw material of history, and you get a lot of working-class voices as well, uh, which is great um, for anybody who's interested in the history of working people in this country. Um, just a little addendum. You can, I've told you about entry books before. I've talked about HS79, the 5 and C for entry books. So this is sort of the coda to the Pentridge Rising story. Um, as I said, the, the Rising was easily defeated, and 24 people in the end were tried to be made an example of by the stage. Um, 14 were transported to Australia for life, including the Brothers Bacon, Thomas and John. Um, others were imprisoned. Uh, but the three sort of main ringleaders, who are men called William Turner, Isaac Ludlam, and Jeremiah Brandreth, who we talked about earlier, the morning shot someone, um, they didn't have, the people who were transported were all sentenced to death, but they had their sentence uh, commuted, um, sort of reduced to transportation. These three didn't, uh, and they were the last men in England to be sentenced to be hung, drawn, and quartered. Um, well, actually, they weren't courted because, as this letter in HS79 signed, signed on behalf of the Prince Regent, um, records the, the Crown decided to grant them to uh, mercy, if you can call it that. So instead of being hung, drawn, and courted, they were just uh, drawn to the place of hanging, then, then, then hanged. Um, they weren't courted, although they were beheaded. So that's, that's, that's something. And an, an unpleasant end to that story. Okay. Um, Hopefully that's given you an idea of the kind of richness you can find in the sort of first stage of Homer's correspondence. As I've said, some of it is searchable, check the guide, and in a very detailed way when it is catalogued. Most of it is done by uh, year. HO40 is sort of kind of catalogued. Some of it's quite good, which I did a couple of years ago, particularly stuff like the Rising, very well catalogued. Um, some bits not so much. Now we're going to move on to the second age of Home Office correspondence, the, the registered period. Uh, just to recap, well, I'm going to recap on the next slide, actually, looking at my notes. So, 
let's have a look at what we got in this second age. So, I mean, there are other series of Home Office correspondence and, and papers in this period, uh, but I'm going to look at these ones because this is where the mainspring of Home Office records are and where you find the most interesting stuff. Um, so, as I've said, in 1848, the Home Office makes the decision to start registering its correspondence and it goes back retrospectively to register stuff from 1839. And we get these three series as a result of it. So, as I said, HF 46, running from 1841 to 1957. The stuff from 1839 is in the 1841 register. It's confusing. Um, basically allows the sort of numbering of correspondences being registered in there. Uh, you just search by year within HF 46, doing an advanced search in the catalogue. <coughs> Pardon me, a bit of a cough. Um, and then order up the volume to have a look through that. It registered papers in these two series. HO 45 runs from 1839 to 1979. Uh, it contains the bulk of the Home Office's correspondence. It is keyword searchable, quite well catalogued. So HO 46 isn't always useful, but HO 46 does record stuff which hasn't survived. HO 144 is supplementary, more, more sensitive matters. Again, keyword searchable, all intents and purposes, as I said, is the same as HO 45, just in a different series. And it starts in 1868 as opposed to 1839. And it ends a bit sooner. Um, yeah, um, HA46 is useful despite the fact that these two are keyword searchable because um, these series, unlike the unsorted correspondence series we looked at just before, uh, they are very heavily what we refer to in the archival world as weeded. Uh, so some papers are selected for historical preservation, many are not, so many don't survive. But HA46 gives us a comprehensive look at what correspondence was registered by the Home Office, even the stuff that doesn't survive. So we can have a look about the things it's doing and using the entry books, which are in some cases more comprehensive than the, the papers we find in 144 and 45, we can try and piece together what the Home Office is thinking about a certain thing in the period. Um, now, I said there were two ages of Home Office correspondence, but there are actually in the second age three mini ages, which I'm going to go over now and try and draw some examples out from. That will make sense in a second, hopefully. So the first part of the second age, um, and these basically deal with the way that the Home Office registers its correspondence, as with any sort of organisation, it sort of evolves its record keeping practice as it goes along. Um, in 1839 through to 1855, HA46 registers are um, arranged chronologically and they are either not indexed or if they are indexed, they're indexed quite, quite poorly. Um, and they also jumble together years in some cases. Um, they can be quite difficult. I would basically suggest in this period that you're probably better off just doing keyword searches in HO45. Um, but if you do want to have a look, your, your only option really is to just order a register for a particular year uh, and browse by the date to try and look for things, because that's generally how things are recorded. There's no way of sort of indexing these registers, so you just have a mass of papers uh, based on when they came in chronologically. And if you don't know when something came in chronologically, obviously that can be quite difficult. But you could use an entry book on a particular subject to try and find dates. But um, yeah, that's. Now we move to the, the second mini age of the second age. I'm going to stop saying this is quite confusing. 1856 to 1871, uh, things get easier in HF 46 because every year the Home Office produces a register, which is basically that chronological register of every piece of correspondence coming in being given a number. But they also produce an index, which allows you to not have to know what date you're looking for. Uh, so it's really useful. And we're going to look at an example from this period of Home Office correspondence registration. Um, and we're going to look into the, um, the, the case of uh, Constance Emily Kent, or Constance Kent, the, uh, the murderer, um, whose uh, story was a... Uh, Immortalised and brought to public attention again by uh, Kate Summerscale's uh, book, The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher, and the, the subsequent, I think, ITV television show, which is sort of fictional, semi fictionalised. Um, some of you may have seen it. I, I have actually not. But we will look into it. Um, for those of you who don't know, basically, um, Constance Kent's father was a man called Samuel Kent, who was a sub inspector of factories employed by the Home Office. Um, and his boss was Mr. Baker, who was the inspector of factories for most of the Western England. 
1860, in June 1860, um, Samuel Kent's three-year-old son, Francis Kent, um, was was found dead in the in the privy of their home, uh, quite quite brutally murdered. Um, I, I shan't uh, talk about the specifics of the murders because any of you, in case any of you are squeamish, but it was it was quite brutal. Um, Scotland Yard sent a detective called uh, Mr. Witcher, uh, I think Jack, but I have not written down his Christian name. I've now forgotten it. Jack Witcher, I think, yes, um, to investigate the murder, uh, and he suspected Constance, the um, Mr. Kent's sixteen-year-old uh, daughter, uh, who was half sister to Samuel. Uh, she was arrested, but she was subsequently released. There was a bit of a to do at the time because uh, Witcher was a was a was a working class man, and uh, Constance was quite a well-to-do lady. Um, so, sort of, there was a bit of an outrage that she was accused. Subsequently, in 1866, uh, Constance confesses the murder to a Roman Catholic priest and asks him to help her um, to, uh, bring herself to justice, which she does. She's convicted of the murder subsequently in 1866, and she spends uh, 20 years in prison, and then she uh, moves uh, to Australia, where she becomes a nurse and dies at the age of 100 in 1944. Uh, this is actually a copy from another um, National Archives record. Uh, this is from her, her prison license, uh, license to be released, and it's a photo book from 1874. You'll find that in the record, Pecom 4, uh, on Farmer Pass, actually. Um, but in 1860, a lot of suspicion falls on Mr. Kent, who, uh, Samuel Kent, who is apparently not the nicest of men anyway. A lot of people suspect him of murdering his own child, and it makes life very difficult for him. So the Home Office takes a sort of a, a large part in trying to, to sort this. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get us to look for a letter from, uh, from Mr. Baker, who is um, who's Mr. Kent's boss, to do with the difficulties faced by Kent in the, the aftermath of him being suspected of his own child's murder. Um, and we can do that, we could do that using the HO45 search. But if we search for Baker and Kent, we don't find anything. If we search for Constance Kent, we do. But I thought this would be a useful way to explore how HO46 works, works and how we can use it now in our current research. So I know that these events took place in 1860, so if I look on the catalogue and make an advanced search in HO46 as a reference for the year 1860, you can see, as I said, we get the register and the index for that year in HO46 slash 24 and slash 25. Now, which one do you use first? Well, obviously you start with the index, which we will do now. I've got some photos of it. Right. So you can see this is HF46-25 here. Now the index, you'll get an alphabetical range for names, but most things are kept under sort of subject cuts, and you can see down the right here, so Admiralty, Alien, this gives you an idea of the sort of range of things that the Home Office is dealing with. Often if you look on the descriptions of HF45 or HF144 files, you will see that these um, subject headings are recorded in the title of the records in all capitals before anything else. But we can see here, I've highlighted factories there, so I've flipped through to that. And then you'll see here in the factories, you'll see there's a letter called saying Baker on Kent's district. I'm just going to ring that. And you see you get the number 6622. Now, HO45 and HO144 records, uh, their references on the National Archives catalogue now are usually, almost always, uh, include the number they are registered under in HO 46. And that's the how the way we sort of find records and that's how we move across now from the contemporary registers from the 1860s in this case to the information that we have on the discovery of the catalogue now. But if you make a search for HO 45, the number 6622, you, you won't find the file you're looking for. And that's why in this period it's important to order the register up as well, because often the Home Office re-registers its correspondence. If I go to the register here, I will get a close-up. So you'll see how the numbers run down this column here. So effectively, it's all in, alpha, it's all in numerical order, and basically the clerks are writing the description of what letter they've registered under each number. 
Oh, sorry. And you'll see oh, the close-up I've brought up here, which is on the, the ring bit here. We can see factory is Mr. Baker on Kent's district. And you can see the numbers here, which would be 6622. Um, but you see someone's written in red pen, OS6970. And that's the home office ring registering correspondence. It often does if it brings files together or if something's of particular significance. We'll give it what they refer to as an old series number. The old series starts in 1848 when they start to re register, well, to register correspondence from 1839 onwards retrospectively. But it continues long after this practice finishes. It's a way of re registering correspondence. Uh, similar to those of you who are, um, who are familiar with uh, Treasury records from the 19th century, they do a very similar thing. So if we then subsequently make a search in Discovery in the catalogue, um, I hope you can see that better than I because my screen is a bit small. But I've made a search here in H HO45 uh, using the uh, search room references box on the advanced search form. Not searching in H144 because that doesn't start in 1868. And I've searched for the number 6970. And you can see here that we get this record. I've got the description here on Kent. And actually, it also includes papers, so it's probably been re registered because um, of the um, inclu subsequent inclusion of papers in 1866 when uh, Constance is, confesses and is convicted of the crime. Um, and it's worth noting here again how I talked about the inclusion of the, the subject cut that things are registered under the description. You see factories here. Um, we have a look through the papers. It doesn't actually provide us with a huge amount of detail about the murder. Um, it gives an interesting insight into how the Home Office operates in this period, and sort of how they try and deal with this sort of minor crisis among their employees. Um, and we mostly received reports from uh, from, uh, from Mr. Baker, Kent's boss, um, and he feels quite a lot of sympathy for Kent. He says um, there's a bit of suspicion that falls upon him. He says these repeated inquiries uh, into the the road. Hill House, which is called the Road House, which is what uh, Kent's house is called. It's in a village called Road in Somerset. Um, these repeated inquiries into the road murder are exceedingly prejudicial to the discharge of Kent's du duties, he says, and I cannot but believe that he is most unjustly accused by the public, because I have seen him in his family and witnessed his affection for his children. But he, this Baker basically says Kent can't do his job. He can't leave his house. People hate him so much. Um, we get some interesting sort of this is a, a Bradshaw's map from 1860. Um, Bradshaw's railway map, as immortalised by Michael Portillo in his um, Great Railway Journeys television series. The black line here taking out Mr. Baker's district, which, as you can see, covers the west of England and Wales. And uh, this is Mr. Kent's district here, so he's covering the west country and sort of southern Wales there, inspecting factories throughout there. But he can't go anywhere, everyone hates him. Um, Baker uh, basically asked the Home Office and they grant the request to uh, give Ken uh, six months leave from his job, but he, uh, he then retires. But he asks to retire slightly strangely on full pay, £500 a year, um, where he gets sort of short shrift. He eventually gets about 280 quid a year from the Treasury. Uh, but we can see this is the back of his letter, uh, and the Home Office often write comments there, and this one actually says, uh, a strange proposal if ever I heard of one. Um, so he doesn't get his full salary because who does on retirement? Um, but they also feel some sympathy for him. There's another letter he sends in where someone writes in the back, he is, he, he is much to be pitied, no doubt. Um, in 1866, Kent tries to get his job back uh, after Constance admits to murder, but um, he's not given it. But uh, it's an interesting look into sort of sort of the way the home was trying to deal with this sort of thing. I mean, this was a massive national news story, a national news story at the time, a sensationalist case. Um, again, I want to talk about entry books, because I think it's important to keep reinforcing the point. You can find the other side of the story here, because you can see those notes in the back, but you don't see the replies from the Home Office to these letters. Um, as I've said, as the range of duties the Home Office expands over the 19th century, so do the number of entry books. There are about 95 different record series of Home Office entry books in all, covering all sorts of things. You can see some examples there. Best way to find one, I would say, is to make a search in the catalogue restricting references to HO um, and uh, looking for the year you're particularly interested in with the words entry books and sort of the subject cut that you, you found records catalogued under in HO45. 
So you can see if I make a search in 8634 factory entry book, you find that the, uh, the factory of mine entry books are in the series HO87 and that HO87 slash free contains uh, the date range I'm interested in. And if you look through, you will find the Home Office's replies to Mr. Baker's letters in there, but we do not have time to look at them. What other things can you find? Um, I just thought I'd find another quick example of something else you can find in this period, uh, and that's uh, some drunk militiamen. Uh, we already dealt with sort of yeomanry and them being a, being a bit carried away at um, the Peterloo massacre, possibly under the influence of alcohol. And there we have definite evidence that there were some militiamen in um, Tower Hamlets in East London, definitely under the influence of alcohol. The Home Office uh, has the role in the 19th century of being sort of the connection between civil and military power. So they can authorise the use of troops to quell riot. Uh, they also have a fair bit of uh, supervision over the police, particularly the Metropolitan Police, as continues to this day. Um, but in 1853, they were caused to uh, call to sort of uh, be the arbiter of a, a, a disagreement between the police and the militia. Uh, it seems that uh, Colonel Gran, who was the commander of the Tower Hamlets militia, had um, sort of had some problems with men turning up to parade drunk, and decided to use the local police cells to uh, to punish them. He basically turned to his own personal brig. Um, basically send NCOs along with these drunken soldiers and ask them to be imprisoned without charge, which the police find quite difficult because they meant to take someone to a magistrate immediately after imprisonment for being drunk to, to be charged. As we spoke about earlier, there is such a thing as habeas corpus, and the police are quite difficult about this. But Grant continues to send men. He starts trying to send them for longer periods, including sending one man who turns up to parade drunk to be imprisoned for seven days without charge as sort of a punishment. But the police point out to the Home Secretary saying, we, we can't do this, we only have four cells, we have a lot of criminals we need to imprison ourselves who are drunk, and we can't imprison anyone for seven days or even 21 days, I think they're asked to do once, because they don't have any food or washing facilities, which would be a particularly unpleasant punishment. Um, eventually, somewhat of an agreement is made between the two parties. Grant agrees to only send the men when they're drunk until they have sobered up, in which case he will get someone to collect them to be taken back for punishment somewhere else. Um, here we can see I'm assuming a sober militiaman from a cartoon from 1903. That's not part of the record, but I thought it was a nice illustration. But here we can see um, a letter uh, in during the matter. Um, yes, yeah, so but yeah, I think it's fair to say that even by Victorian standards, being in prison for seven days without food is a bit much. But that's just an example of the other kind of papers you can find in this period. Uh, have a look through the catalogue, make some keyword search on the subject that you're interested in, or write up a HO46 and just look at a range of stuff that people are doing that year. Uh, they really are fascinating. Now we're going to move on to the, the, the third age of, of the Home Office correspondence being registered, um, which runs from 1871 through 1949. This is the final one. Um, we get rid of the separate registers and indexes, um, and instead we have multiple registers which also act as indexes for each year, which are arranged by subject cut in an alphabetical order. Um, so you need to think about the subject cut you might find something under and then order the appropriate range. I don't know what happened to D this year. Um, obviously nothing happened with D in the name. But what kind of subject cuts do we find? Just worth about, I'm just going to jump out of the 19th century for a second and look at something to do with, with suffragettes and what kind of cuts, a subject cuts within a HO46 register, we would find uh, material to do with suffragettes because it does range. Things like criminal compensation, elections, disturbances, prisoners and prisons, prisons and prisoners, sorry, suffragettes and criminal cases. And you can see again throughout HO45 and HO144. The subject cuts are recorded in the title of the record. So it's worth having a play around on HO45. Also, if you're at the National Archives, you can look at the paper catalogues, which often have lists of subject of subjects in the Home Office papers, uh, and then order the appropriate register for there. Now, We're going to go back to our old friends' riots, because everyone likes riots, back into the 19th century, very late 19th century, 1896. Um, and so for the purpose of this exercise, I'm going to say that I'm interested in riots in the year of 1896. So I know from earlier that a lot of riots are classified under the subject 
heading disturbances. So I make an advanced search and discovery for HO46 for the year 1896. And you'll see here that you get the alphabetical range. And if I'm looking for disturbances, then I want to order HO46 slash 117, which has the alphabetical range D to P. Um, now, there we go. As before, we're looking at the 146 uh, for 1860, we have these, these subject cuts, as we'd expect. But this time, fortunately, there is no need to consult a register, which means one less document to order, which is nice. Um, now, if I open up the disturbances page, um, we can see, I mean, hopefully you can see, in the photo, I've got a zoomed info I'll show you in a minute. But uh, a lot of the papers in 1896 through disturbances, in, in basically most of the first page and some of the second page, seem to uh, deal with something which is referred to as fish riots, Newlin, Newlin being in Cornwall. Um, yes, there's a zoom in. So you can see here, there's the first entry fish riot, Newlin. And you can see here that all the papers going down seem to have the same number with suffixes afterwards. So they're all numbered X58892 and then slash two, slash three, slash four, slash five, slash six, etc., etc., etc. Why is that? It's because in this period the Home Office starts giving paper numbers to a particular bits of a file. They start keeping quite large files of a particular subject. Very similar to the Foreign Office, um, for those of you who are familiar with the way that the Foreign Office keeps records in a record series like FO371, for instance, although the Foreign Office do it after the Home Office to a certain extent. Uh, the Home Office are considered to have one of the better registry systems by the 1895, I think, uh, 1898 possibly, into the Parliament Committee on Registry Systems, which is a riveting read, I assure you. Um, now, if I make a search in the catalogue in HO for X58892, not restricting the year because very rarely these numbers are replicated. You will see I get this file here, HO144 slash 662 slash X58892, disturbances, Newland, riot, and fishermen. And you can see, I suppose there's an important thing I haven't picked up on before. I've been making advanced searches, but then searching for the number from HO46 in the, the all these words box, as opposed to trying to make a complete reference in the references box. And that's because often there will be additional numbers, particularly later in the 19th century, added to HO144 and HO. Because often there will be additional numbers, particularly later in the 19th century, added to HO144 and HO45 references to deal with how they're stored. Um, so it's important to, to not try and do the exact reference straight away because it, it, it may not work and that may not be because the file doesn't survive as many don't it may be because there's an additional number somewhere in there um, now if we look see some of the files and you can see how the paper numbers are not replicated in the cataloging for the file itself but you see when you actually order up you get a whole bundle of different papers each bound up in little folders and you'll see you get the number up there and then the, 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 the sort of sub number, the paper number two here. That's the first paper. So you see that has no number next to it. It's just X58892. Um, now, I imagine I've tantalized you now. I'm mentioning the Newland Fish Riots and you're wondering, what, what are those, Chris? Well, thankfully, I can tell you because I've read the files. Um, Newland is a, basically a village which is now basically uh, continuous with Penzance and Cornwall. Um, in 1896, it is home to one of Britain's uh, large, one of Britain's largest fishing fleets. Many of the fishermen in Newland are Methodists or other non-conformists, and they are very, very strict about observing not, you know, the Sabbath, and they don't land fish on a Sunday. People who have no such qualms about landing fish in the markets in Newland on a Sunday, though, are fishermen from Lower Stoft and Yarmouth, up around Norfolk Way. Um, who realising that the Newland men don't work on Sundays, or won't sell on Sundays, get in the habit of heading down to the Cornish fishing grounds on a Saturday and then pulling into harbour on a Sunday and selling fish. And this really upsets the Newland fishermen because um, it floods the market and drives down their prices so they find it hard to make a living. They try and get restitution between sort of various negotiations peacefully, 
but they're getting nowhere. And after a particularly rough patch on the 18th of May 1896, uh, they take direct action, and I really do mean action. Um, now, before we were looking at the very start of the webinar about uh, reports of the P Peterloo massacre only reaching the Home Office the next day, having been sort of taken on a rip roaring coach ride down from Manchester. 1896, uh, telegraphy is, is, is everywhere. So the Home Office received reports very, very quickly. This is the, the first report uh, on the 18th of May from New Lynn, from a fish merchant called Hobson, uh, and that turned up in London at 2.35 p.m., having been sent uh, about um, 40, 50 minutes beforehand. Um, and uh, he says, uh, well, he basically says, great riot here. East country boats, fish thrown into the sea, boats damaged, crews intimidated, authorities doing all can, but helpless. Please send help. Send help. Um, so obviously things are going down there quite a lot. Um, and basically what was going on was um, the Cornish men were invading the uh, the Lower Stofton uh, Yarmouth men's boats as they landed in Newland, throwing their catches overboard and often taking their boats out of the sea and trying to damage them. They were also attacking fishermen, fish merchants, the harbour master. It was really quite serious. Uh, we get further reports here. Uh, a man called um, Arno, uh, Arno Capo, Arnold Capo, sorry, Arnold Caps, I apologise, who's the secretary of the Lowest Off Boat Owners Association. He sends in a telegram to the Home Office soon after that from Lowest Off himself, having received telegrams from Newland reporting the events. Um, and he's very concerned. And he says as well, serious riot at Newland, Penzance. Cornish fishermen taking possession of lowest off a Yarmouth fishing boats by placing 20 men on board each one as they arrive, throwing all fish overboard, stop boats leaving harbour, endanger the safety of some nearby, sailing them on rocks, throwing all stores and movables into sea. Uh, he says that the, the Cornishmen act like pirates. Authorities helpless. 200, 200 lowest off boat owners pray you order full police protection, if inadequate, Ask for military, fear great loss of life and property. So it's quite serious. I mean, these are the sort of real life pirates of Penzance. Um, although, um, obviously, don't turn out to be of noble birth, so they can't be saved. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen that. Um, as a result of this, tens of thousands of mackerel are thrown overboard, um, and the police can't do it. There's not enough of them in Cornwall. So um, two, 300 troops are sent to New Lynn uh, on, on by train to try and deal with it. And also uh, the Royal Navy has to send a gunboat into the harbour to try and stop the boats from leaving and stop the New Lynn right. really is quite serious and it's sort of quite sleepy at this, at this point in time, part of Cornwall. Um, nonetheless, despite the fact that two branches of the armed services, armed forces, turn up to try and deal with this, the riot carries on to the 22nd of May. They start brawling with men from Penzance who support the lowest off men in the street. It's it's crazy. Um, amazing story. I I found it by chance. And um, now um, obviously there are consequences, but not as many as you think actually. Uh, so and mostly because the authorities are really quite. Cons I mean, a lot of people felt quite badly for the Cornish fishermen. They were being done out of, of making a living mostly by quite wealthy fish merchants from Lowestoft and the wealthy fish merchants in Cornwall. But also because there was just so much fear that if there was too much retribution against the rioters, um, there'd be a resumption of, uh, of violence. And they were so fearful of that that despite the fact that the riot finished on May 22nd, the troops don't leave until the 9th of June, and the gunboat stays for even longer. Um, and it's not often that, you know, I think it would be quite amazing today if a, the Royal Navy destroyer came down into sort of, I don't know, a fishing harbour and tried to stop things there. It's very strange. Um, so eventually, uh, though, eight of these uh, these real life uh, pirates of, of quite near Penzance uh, were convicted of rioting and sort of various offences. Um, but the judge takes pity on them and doesn't imprison them. He just gets them to play a bond for their good behaviour, um, and I think a small fine in one case. Um, and the file H O forty one point four slash six six two slash X five eight eight nine two. Um, records a sort of pleasant end to this story because the people in New England are actually delight, absolutely delighted that their heroes have been saved from imprisonment. Uh, and they themselves get telegrams from Bodmin where the trial is taking place. And at first they're incredulous that um, these men would have been saved from imprisonment. 
but as it becomes, um, these men arrive back into Penzance, uh, there's police to make sure that the youths from Penzance who don't like the new Lin men don't get involved. Um, but there are people cheering for them when they arrived. Um, and then it reports that in the evening there were brass bands in the town playing, everybody came out, uh, bunting everywhere. And uh, in the evening they lit hundreds of candles and put them all over the keys of New Lind Harbour so that they're twinkling in the night. This sort of celebration, I mean, uh, they didn't actually get the sort of solution they wanted to to the, to the problem, but there was some negotiation. But um, I just think it's a really interesting story of, of something that we don't really know about from the late 19th century, of just sort of direct action being taken. Um, and hopefully it gives you an idea of how HO46 can suddenly lead you to looking up some very interesting papers, because he suddenly says quite a lot of things about a fish fry that you'd never heard of. So we're coming to the end now, I just thought we'd do a little recap and summary. Um, so before 1839, you could find un incoming correspondence in unsorted and often uncatalogued series like uh, HO42 and HO52. Check the guide for more information. In 1848, the Home Office begins registering papers and it goes back to 1839 to re-register them. The papers themselves are, are registered in HO46, these big ledgers which give the numbers for each one and, and sometimes indexed later years. These are searchable by year. And the papers themselves are physically in series HO45 and HO144, which are not just searchable using the registers, they are also keyword searchable. And finally, remember the entry book contains copies of outgoing letters and are usually in separate record series for each subject. And you can use a catalog search to try and find those. Um, here ended the webinar. So Emilia asked for me and William Petty, who was the first um, Home Secretary, to ask if anybody has any questions. Uh, and I'm going to hand back now. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>